Hello and welcome. My name is Sheila Doles and my pronouns are she, her. As we begin our service, I invite you to silence your phone, close other windows on your computer, take a deep breath and center yourself for worship. We open in welcome to the ancestral people of this land, acknowledging that our church, like all of Burke, rests on the unceded territory of the Monahawk tribe of the Great Sioux Nation. We seek healing and the realization of justice on this, in this land who live on in their descendants, the present day members of the Monacan Indian Nation, the Potawatomi Indian Tribe of Virginia, and the Piscataway Indian Nation. We honor the ancestors as we move toward healing so that all together may someday know full justice. We have a wonderful special service today led by our very own Jen Carlson, introducing our study topic for this year, Reproductive Justice. Welcome to Akatink Universal, Unitarian Universalist Church. I am Jen Carlson, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm happy to be your guest speaker today. I hope you got a name tag or have put your name on, Zoom, on your Zoom name tag. If you need help with that, let us know in the chat. I know I'm a bad example of a name tag, but mine disappeared over COVID and I still haven't replaced it, so bad on me. Um, if you aren't new to Akatink, look around. Do you see people that you haven't met or haven't spoken to in a while? These people like you and want to meet you. Help us live into our mission and be a welcoming and inclusive spiritual home for all by reaching out and making a connection. By visiting this congregation, newcomers are in a transition moment, and people in transitions are more open to new friendships. This means that your new best friend might be here this morning, or your old best friend. Uh, and this is your chance to get to know them before someone else does. Whether you're a longtime member, or a newcomer, or something in between, we encourage you to stay for our social hour online and in person immediately following the service. And I know most of you will, because we're going to be celebrating Rad after the service. So whether you're a longtime member, oh, we're so delighted you decided to join us today, and welcome. As we light our chalice, please join in reciting these words from our mission statement. Together, we care in community. Together, we grow in spirit. Together, we act for justice. So this is the month of covenant. Our minister will, let me try that again, Reverend William Rev, Lev, what? <laughs> affectionately known as Rev Lev, and that's a lot easier for me to say, um, is in the pulpit most Sundays, but this morning we have a very special service introducing our social justice study action focus for this year. The focus is on reproductive justice, which is related to, but not synonymous with reproductive rights. It's okay if that isn't anything you know about yet. Today, Akatink member Jen Carlson will introduce us to reproductive justice as our guest preacher, and we'll have many more opportunities throughout the year to deepen our understanding of reproductive justice and what actions we're called to take as individuals and as a community. Those actions include voting, marching, and dancing to keep our spirits up as we show up for people's rights to have children, to not have children, to raise children in a safe environment and healthy environment, and to protect everyone's right to bodily autonomy. Good morning. Good morning. All right, today in our time for all ages, we are going to talk about the importance and value of voting and why voting matters for you. Voting is a powerful way to express your voice and influence the future of your country, state, and community. <laughs> voting is a right and a privilege that many people in the world do not have or must fight for it is also a civic duty that honors the sacrifices of those who fought for democracy. Voting is a way to hold your elected representatives accountable 
and to support the issues and policies that matter to you and your fellow citizens. Voting is a way to participate in the democratic process and to shape the society you live in, your vote can make a difference in local, state, and national elections. Voting is a way to empower yourself and your generation. Young voters have the potential to sway the outcome of elections and to demand change on the challenges they face. And lastly, voting is a way to be a part of history and to contribute to the legacy of your democracy. Your vote is your voice and your voice matters. I've chosen a book entitled V is for Voting, an ABC book that introduces progressive families to concepts like social justice and civil rights and reminds readers that every vote counts. So this is an engaging introduction to the tenets of democracy. It's playful and poetic and a powerful primer about the importance of voting and activism. So V is for Voting, written by Kate Farrell, illustrated by Caitlin Kuwald. A is for Active Participation. B is for building a more equal nation. C is for citizens' rights and our duty. D is for difference, our strength and our beauty. E is for engagement, we all need to care. F is for a free press to find facts and share. G is for govern, to lead and to guide. H is for homelands that we've occupied. I is for inching ahead bit by bit. The march is a long one, but we cannot quit. J is for judges. They're meant to be fair, to be neutral, unbiased, objective, they swear. K is for knowing that you can take part. L is for local, and that's where you start. M is for matter and every vote does. N is for never forgetting what was. O is for onward, keep progress in sight. P is for protest, when we need to fight. Q is for questions, I've got one or three. Mm -hmm. R is for represent, they work for me. S is for suffrage the right to a vote. This fight is ongoing, not history's footnote. T is for talented teachers in schools. Well-informed citizens don't suffer fools. U is for unbought, unbossed, undeterred. V is for voting to make your voice heard. W is for working for change, win or lose. X marks the spot on the ballot you choose. Y is for you. We need everyone's hand. Z is for zeal. Please bring yours. Take a stand. So today in our spiritual development class, we're going to discuss some ways that we can make our voice heard as young people. In the United States of America, we can influence the direction our government takes with our participation. Even if you aren't old enough to vote in an election, you can still participate and make your voice heard. Thank you so much. Our reading today is from two things every UU should know about reproductive justice. Reproductive justice has a different approach. It's not enough to focus on reaching a set of end goals through any means possible. Instead, our approach must reflect the world we are trying to create. This includes constantly talking about the impact our identities, including race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, wealth, etc., have on our viewpoints and actions to successfully change the culture we must be open to growth and change ourselves. 
Centering the marginalized. Changing structures of power mean that leadership must come from the groups most affected by the denial of access to rights and resources, including women and people of color, people struggling to make ends meet, and young people. Intersectionality. The work must be intersectional, which means engaging multiple identities and building coalitions rather than trying to keep people and issues confined to separate boxes. Changing structures of power require that we view identities as linked and formulate solutions based on collaboration and solidarity. For people who support reproductive justice and are not already familiar with the framework, it's sometimes challenging but always essential to seek relationships of accountability and leadership with women of color and the organizations they lead. This is critical because it helps to avoid misappropriation where people are claiming to do reproductive justice work without knowing what it means and without being accountable for the experience and leadership of women of color. Good morning, my Atkinson family. Good morning. Thank you for joining me today as we embark on an exploration of our upcoming study year topic, one that touches nearly every aspect of our society, reproductive justice. Now, before your imagination conjures up images of courtroom dramas and abortion debates, let me assure you we're about to dive into a world far more intricate, intricate, a world that shapes the lives of all genders and identities, families and communities in profound ways. I do promise to infuse a touch of unintentional humor at the expense of some of our politicians. That's why we're concentrating on voting today too. So what exactly is reproductive justice? It's more than a discussion about reproductive rights or health. It is an intersectional perspective, one that ensures all individuals have the right to make informed choices about their reproductive lives without facing discrimination, barriers, or inequalities. Think of it as a masterpiece that brings together personal agency, bodily autonomy, equality, and health resonating through our society like a harmonious symphony. The definition of reproductive justice is made up of three points, and just like our seven principles evolved to become eight, the definition is evolving, evolving to contain a fourth. Number one, the right to have children. Number two, the right not to have children. Number three, the right to parent in safe and supportive environments. And number four, the right to bodily autonomy. So let's talk about the right to have children. Imagine this is the opening act of our sympathy, the right to have children. It's a fundamental human right that speaks to the heart of individual autonomy and deeply personal decisions that shape the course of our lives. This right, seemingly simple yet immensely profound, encapsulates the essence of personal agency, love, and the hope for the future. In a world where diverse families and paths to parenthood are celebrated, this right shines as a beacon of human freedom and choice. At the heart of this right lies the principle that individuals should be able to form families without facing societal prejudice or legal barriers. It embraces the diversity of families, whether they are headed by a single parent, a same-sex couple, or individuals choosing to become parents through adoption or assistive reproductive technologies. By celebrating these diverse paths to parenthood, we create a society that values love, commitment, and the emotional bonds that bind families together. A society that truly values the right to have children is one that supports parents at every stage of their journey, from conception to childbirth and beyond. However, the right to have children also carries with the ethical considerations, particularly in a world grappling with overpopulation and environmental challenges, which leads us to number two, the right not to have children. In the intricate symphony of human rights, there exists a thread that speaks volumes about personal autonomy and individual choices, the right not to have children. This right often overlooked in discussions about reproductive rights 
is a fundamental cornerstone of modern society that recognizes the diverse paths that individuals may take in shaping their lives. It is an affirmation that parenthood is a conscious choice, not a compulsory duty, and that one's decision not to have children deserves the same respect as the decision to become a parent. It's worth noting that this right is especially significant for those who identify as women, who have historically shouldered the burden of societal expectations and pressures to become mothers. The right to not to have children liberates them from the confines of these expectations and economic restrictions, allowing them to define their, define their identities on their own terms. As we advocate for the right not to have children, it is essential to remember that reproductive rights encompass a spectrum of choices, each deserving of respect and validation. Just as we defend, defend the right to have children, so too must we uphold the right to not have children as a testament to individual autonomy and the evolution of our societal norms. Number three, the right to parent in a safe and supportive environment. As we move into the third movement of, movement of our sympathy, envision a grand crescendo of applause. The right to parent in a safe and supportive environment. This includes access to quality health care, education, and economic opportunities. Just like a symphony with its harmonious notes and crescendos, the right to parent in a safe and supportive environment resonates through the stories of countless families. Picture a young parent striving to provide for their child while working two jobs. Wouldn't it be remarkable if they had access to affordable childcare, paid parental leave, quality health care? These elements are not just luxuries, they're cornerstones of a supportive environment that enables parents to thrive. Imagine a world where every child grows up in an environment that nurtures their potential and safeguards their well-being. This is not a utopian dream, it's a fundamental right. We often hear the term, it takes a village to raise a child, and that sentiment couldn't be truer. Parenthood is a journey that's both beautiful and challenging, but in, and it's essential that we create a society where parents have access to the resources, support, and conditions they need to raise their children in safe and nurturing environments. But our symphony doesn't end there. It extends to creating inclusive communities that celebrate the diversity of families, whether it's single parent, same sex couple, grandparent raising their grandchildren. Every family deserves respect and acceptance. Imagine a world where parents are not judged by their circumstances, but celebrated for their love, commitment, and dedication. Let's also acknowledge here the importance of comprehensive sexuality education. When young people are armed with knowledge about their bodies, relationships, and reproductive choices, they're better equipped to make informed decisions about when and if they want to become parents. A society that values education empowers its citizens to navigate the complexities of parenthood with confidence. I promised a bit of unintentional humor from some of our nation's lawmakers, and I will redeem that coupon here. As you may know, I'm an ALL facilitator here at Atkinson, as well as a birth worker who has seen more than 565 lives into the world, not to mention my two favorite, who I think are at home sleeping. Um, so I feel I come to you with some confidence in my understanding of the biology of the reproductive year. Let's add a certain je ne sais quoi to this parade of misguided statements from our well-informed, well-informed politicians. <laughs> These gems of wisdom make it seem like they missed a crucial lesson in biology class. Just realize that these are the voices that are shaping our reproductive policy. Picture this, the former Illinois Congressman Joe Walsh once said, understand though, when we talk about exceptions, we talk about rape, incest, health of a woman, life of a woman. Life of a woman is not an exception. Clearly, Mr. Walsh is under the impression that a woman's life isn't really a big deal when it comes well to her own life. But wait, it gets even better. You remember when Representative Todd Aiken from Missouri once enlightened, uh, once enlightened us with his thoughts on biology. If it's a legitimate rape, the female body has ways to shut that whole thing down. Yes, you heard that right. Apparently, women possess an incredible shutdown mechanism, like a built-in security system in case of, well, you know, legitimate situations. 
Our journey through this intellectual maze continues with a statement from an Arizona bill signed into law by Governor Jan Brewer. Life begins from the first day of the last menstrual period of the pregnant woman. So life, according to Arizona law, starts before conception. Someone has better up, have, needs to update those biology textbooks. When Senator Clyde Chambliss of, Ari of Alabama, for example, was asked if the law would allow incest victims to obtain abortions, he responded, yes, until she knows she's pregnant. <laughs> he did not elaborate on how someone would have an abortion before they know they're pregnant, outside of claiming it takes time for the chromosomes to come together. Don't worry, folks, the confusion doesn't stop there. Ohio State Representative John Becker once advocated for a bill to reimplant an ectopic pregnancy, a procedure that does not exist. And it's not in any way a treatment for, life, uh, for a life-threatening ectopic pregnancy. And this was his response. I heard about it over the years. I never questioned it or gave it a lot of thought. The quintessential approach to policy making, don't question, don't think, just assume and proceed. <laughs> Friends, these statements remind us that in the realm of reproductive rights, it's not just about the policies, it's also about the quality of understanding behind those policies. Our bodies, lives, and futures are quite literally in the hands of those who seemingly couldn't pass a high school health class. That's part of what's so hard about watching these debates in the you know, online forum of ideas. It's not that just rights and autonomy are being legislated away. It's being done by those who need comprehensive sexuality education to understand the basics of human biology. Okay, to bring this movement to an end, let us consider the impact of affordable and accessible healthcare that can, ha that can have dire consequences for families. A routine doctor's visit should not be a luxury. And prenatal care should not be a right, should be a right, not a privilege. But this journey towards safe and supportive environments is not without its obstacles. Many parents face systemic equality, inequalities, discrimination, and economic hardships. Paid family leave, affordable housing, mental health support are not just policy demands. They're essential steps towards creating a nurturing environment for parents and their children. Brings us to number four, the right to bodily autonomy. Finally, our fourth and concluding movement, the right to bodily autonomy. Imagine a world where the phrase, my body, my choice, is a universal truth with no asterisks or exceptions. Reproductive justice recognizes that every individual possesses the fundamental right to make decisions about their own bodies, decisions that enc encompass contraception, abortion, medical treatments, and more. At its core, the right to bodily autonomy is the idea that each individual has the inherent right to make choices about their own body free from external influence or coercion. The concept is an essential pillar of human, right, human rights frameworks, redirecting the understanding that our bodies are not just vessels, but extensions of our identities, values, and personal aspirations. However, the right to bodily autonomy is not a solitary assertion. It exists within a tapestry of ethical considerations and societal responsibilities. Balancing individual autonomy with the greater good requires thoughtful dialogue and a recognition of the potential impact of one's choices on others. While ind individuals have the right to make choices about their own bodies, those choices should not infringe upon the rights and well-being of others. As we navigate the intricacies of this right, it is important to acknowledge that it's not universally respected or upheld. Across the world, individuals face barriers and restrictions on their bodily autonomy, ranging from limited access to contraception and comprehensive sexual education to outright bans on certain medical procedures. Now I'd like, uh, we're embarking on a year of dedicated exploration and advocacy for reproductive justice. And our journey will take us through a spectrum of crucial topics. I want to emphasize that the study years probably won't introduce anything truly new unless you're one of the previously mentioned politicians. <laughs> what I do hope you will discover is a change in your thinking and a shared understanding of how intersectional reproductive justice really is. 
Many of us are already doing work toward the goals of reproductive justice in our other social justice causes. From the upcoming Virginia elections and their implication for our local communities' abortion rights to the significance of reproductive justice within the LBGTQIA community, we will dive deep into these conversations, shedding light on the challenges, victories, and the ongoing work that lies ahead. Throughout this year of study, reflection, and advocacy, we aim to expand our understanding of reproductive justice beyond its traditional boundaries. Armed with knowledge and empathy, we will be better equipped to advocate for policies and practices that honor the rights and dignities of all individuals, regardless of their backgrounds or their identities. Our journey begins now, and together we can pave the way for a more just and equitable reproductive landscape. As we bring our symphony of reproductive justice to a close, Remember the words of Malala Yousafzai, Yousaf I can't say this, Malala <laughs> Yousafzai, who courageously fought for girls' education and said, we cannot succeed when half of us are held back. Reproductive justice seeks to shatter those barriers that hinder half of our society. Let us be architects of change, conductors of a symphony that harmonizes equality and empowerment for all. As we step out of the space, may we carry the melody of reproductive justice in our hearts, working collectively to shape a world where every individual's reproductive choices are honored and respected. That being said, I can use some help if anyone's interested in implement, helping me implement this study here. If you feel drawn at all to, I know Allison, I already got you on my list. <laughs> If you feel drawn to assist us in this endeavor, please let me or Joe Tuggle know. I can also be reached on my worship team email at worship at Thank you, and let's persist in our pursuit of a world where reproductive, reproductive justice truly thrives. May it be so, and may we be among those who make it so. Blessed be. As we extinguish our chalice, I invite you to join me now in our community blessing with these words of David Bamba. This church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences and beneath all our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time, death, and the space between the stars. We pause now in silent witness to that unity. <laughs>